So welcome everyone to this presentation of the book discussion, The Young Lords, authored by Dr. Joanna Fernandez. Welcome Dr. Fernandez to our college and thank you for doing this. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce everyone this evening. Uh, my name is Ernest Yolongo. I'm the chair of the Behavioral Social Sciences Department from which emanates this social science speaker series uh, from one of our units, the social science unit. So um, it's also my pleasure to thank a number of people before we get started. So of course, first and foremost, welcome Dr. Fernandez to Hostos Community College. We really appreciate you making the time to be here uh, for us and for our students. And, um, and here in the South Bronx, there's nothing more appropriate than your book being discussed here. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Professor Marcella Benciveni, the primary organizer of this event, who is the current union, uh, excuse me, unit coordinator for the social science unit in the behavioral social sciences department. I also want to thank the president's office and specifically funding through the Mackenzie Scott Diversity Initiative Grant and their help in this matter, specifically the president's office for logistical support and by broader extension to Ms. Diana Kramer, Mr. Nelson Ortiz, Ms. Soldanella Rivera and Mr. Jose uh, Ortiz as well for all of their help to make this so um, really flawless from what I've seen so far and seamless. And with that, um, it is my very great pleasure to pass the baton to our former and soon to be returning unit coordinator and really the engine behind the social science speaker series, Dr. Chris Burrell. Dr. Burrell. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Professor Yolongo said, I'm, I'm Christopher Burrell of the Behavioral Social Sciences Department, and I teach US history here at Ostos. Uh, the social sciences speaker series, of which this is a part, and the companion Emerging Scholar Speaker Series were established in 2014 and 2017, respectively. The Social Sciences Speaker Series specifically was initiated at the urging of our former colleague, Dr. Peter Roman, who was always thinking about more ways to improve the quality of educational experiences for OSTO students. The goals of both of these series have been to introduce the OSTOS community, particularly our students, to cutting edge research in the social sciences as we define them here and provide opportunities for discussion and inquiry about issues and topics relevant to the South Bronx and broader American communities. Both series have grown in popularity over time and included both nationally renowned and early career scholars who have been so generous in discussing their work and engaging with our students. Previous participants have included Historians Eric Foner, David Nassau, Joshua Freeman, Clarence Taylor, and Stephen Bradley, among others, as well as former Black Panther Erica Huggins, former U.S. Congressman Jose Serrano, and Dr. Rafael Ortiz of Lenox Hill Hospital. With that brief introduction of the two series out of the Social Sciences Unit of the Behavioral and Social Sciences Department, I turn our virtual floor back over to my friend and colleague, Ms. Diana Kramer of the President's Office. Thank you so much, Professor Burrell, and good afternoon to one and all. Uh, my name is Diana Kramer, and I serve as the Executive Chief of Staff here in the Office of the President, and it is my distinct honor to share with you some remarks from our dear President, Dr. Desi Coco de Filipis, and they are as follows. The turmoil of the 1960s was a catalyst for great and sweeping change. Individuals and organizations around the world sought liberation, self-determination, and a world in which justice wasn't merely an idle promise. Community action groups were formed across the nation. San Francisco gave birth to the Diggers, Oakland to the Black Panthers, and Chicago witnessed the creation of the Young Lords. It wasn't long before branches of the Lords existed in New York City and in other East Coast locations. Our guest today, the writer and educator, Dr. Joanna Fernandez, has drawn on a vast array of archival material to tell their story. It's a fascinating account of a critical time in the life of the nation and in the city we call home. Like the Young Lords, Ostos was created by a fiercely committed group of Puerto Rican activists and their supporters. The Black poet Langston Hughes once famously asked, what happens to a dream deferred? How were the goals of the Young Lords realized? To what extent? And what is their legacy? Our thanks to Dr. Fernandez for joining us today and to the Educating for Diversity, Ms. Mackenzie Scott's gift, President's Initiatives for making this event possible. And thank you so much to the incredible faculty behind this event. Professor Benchigeni. 
Thank you. Thank you all for your wonderful remarks. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and really, really welcome. Um, I am so pleased to uh, introduce our uh, speaker for today and to discuss this book on the Young Lords with Dr. Johanna Fernandez, whom I have known first as a political activist and then as a scholar and a colleague here at CUNY. Uh, Dr. Fernandez is an associate professor of history at Baruch College. And in addition to being the author of The Young Lords, which we will discuss obviously shortly, she is also the editor of Writing on the Wall, a uh, selected prison writing of Mumia Bujamal. Uh, Mumia Bujamal, for those of you who might not have heard of, is an American political activist who was convicted for the murder of a police officer in Philadelphia and sentenced to death in 1982, I believe. Um, he became widely known while he was on uh, death row for his uh, critical writing and commentary on the American criminal uh, justice system. And eventually, after uh, really years of tests and struggles and appeals, his uh, death penalty was eventually overturned by a federal court in 2011. To and the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment without parole. So Dr. Fernandez was able to uh, really establish a long-term uh, relationship, you know, uh, with Mumia Jamal, and uh, she also co-edited with him a special issue for the Journal of Socialism and Democracy, uh, dealing with uh, really the history of the roots of mass incarceration in. Uh, the United States, and that was published in 2014. Um, Dr. Fernandez has also ventured in uh, film writing. She is the executive producer of the film Justice on Trial, which also focuses on the case of Munia Bujabal, which was released in 2010. And most recently, I believe she curated uh, an exhibit on the Young Lords titled The Presente, The Young Lords in New York, which was uh, featured in three um, museums in New York City and was actually mentioned by the New York Times as one of the year top 10 uh, best in art exhibits. She writes regularly for mainstream national and international newspapers, and she has also appeared in uh, many radio, online, and televised media, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, interestingly, and uh, my favorite, Democracy Now! Um, finally, I should also mention that she has been the recipient of many awards, including a Fulbright Scholar Grant to the Middle East, which uh, led her to Jordan, and um, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship at the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture in um, New York at the uh, New York Public Library. Um, so I am delighted, Dr. Fernandez, to have you over. And um, I mentioned this in the chat. What we thought we would do is for me to really engage Dr. Fernandez with a series of questions that will let her to talk uh, in more details about her book. And then by, I would say, um, no later than 4.30, we will open it up to the audience and see if they have additional questions they would like to ask her. And so if you like to uh, ask a question, you can use the Q&A uh, button um, on your screen. Um, I would prefer that you use that versus the chat because it will make it easier for us to sort the questions from just general comments. So uh, Dr. Fernandez, I welcome you again. And I would like to start really with uh, the book of your, of uh, the title of your book, sorry, which obviously is self-explanatory. Can you tell us 
who were the young lords, but also why do you call their history radical? What does that word radical mean to you? Before I start, um, someone, we're living in the world of Zoom, so someone actually knocked on my door while you were introducing me, Dr. Bencivani. Ben Civeni. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. I'm very emotional as you all have um, introduced the book and introduced me because I'm also from the Bronx. So it's very amazing to be able to come back to the Bronx and talk about the story. So I'm really emotional. I also want to uh, thank Christopher Burrell for, for organizing this amazing um, forum. Um, and the president's office, Diana Kramer, for, um, for your introduction of the book, and Professor Lalango, and also Nelson Ortiz, who helped me get onto um, this uh, platform uh, right in the nick of time. So I thank you. And I am absolutely honored because I know all the professors who've spoken. Um, and I know Erica Huggins, a former Black Panther. Um, Eric Foner was my professor at Columbia, and so was uh, Professor Josh Freeman. And Clarence Taylor is my colleague at Baruch College. Um, so I'm, I'm just honored to be part of that distinguished roster of, um, of professors who are committed to, to the writing of history. Okay, so. This question is fascinating, uh, Professor Benchivani, because when I wrote the book, I was referring to my writing of history as a radical history, not that the young lords are produce the radical history. Um, so when I read your question, uh, it offered an opportunity to talk about radical history and what is it. And I'm part of a long legacy of professors and historians who um, write radical histories, whether they'll tell you or not. Eric Foner is a radical um, history professor. So is Josh Freeman um, and Clarice Taylor for sure. Uh, so what does radical mean? Um, that term is, uh, is maligned, it's impugned, it's bad news when you hear it in mainstream uh, news uh, or conversation. But radical means getting at the root, grasping the roots, assessing the root causes. Uh, and so the young lords are radicals because they were revolutionaries who sought to understand the root causes of social problems like racism, like uh, medical discrimination, which they fought against at Lincoln Hospital. Um, they wanted to understand you know, why, uh, why slavery happened and what led to the emergence of capitalism. And they were anti-capitalist, but historians, who are part of the radical tradition um, also seek to understand history. We're usually in the business of writing history that is value laden. And we do not believe that it is possible to be objective in the writing of history. Even when you think you're not, uh, your objective, you're, you're actually writing from a perspective that often you're unaware of. Radical um, historians also seek to uncover voices that are usually not heard. So we write from the perspective of the working class, or we write from the perspective of racially oppressed people. Um, and we are committed to rigorous research, um, but but we want to write history in part to illuminate um, the problems in society um, and tip the hat to those who seek to transform it. And clearly the young lords were 
one of those groups. So tell us a little bit about them. All right, so I have some, um, some slides here, which might be interesting as I, um, as I talk about the Young Lords to, to share them with you. So I'm gonna see if this works. You know, we do this every day, but there's always a glitch. Let's see, share screen. Let's see what happens. Um, can you see my screen? No, okay, stop sharing. Try it again. I was able to see it. Oh, you could see it? Okay, great. Yeah. Can you see that? Yep. I, um, I'm hoping that this is visible to all, not just to the panelists. Okay, uh, so yeah. everybody got it. All right, hold on one second. Let's see. I want the slideshow to be shown. Here, yeah, play from start. All right. So, so the, your question is, who were the Young Lords? Um, the Young Lords started out as a street organization or a gang in Chicago, whose leader, Chacha Jimenez, uh, decided when he was in prison uh, in 1968 uh, during the uprisings produced by the assassination of Martin Luther King, he, he had an awakening in prison, a political awakening after reading uh, The Seven Story Mar Mountain by Thomas Merton, a monk. Um, he read the autobiography of Malcolm X and he read Martin Luther King's um, Where Do We Go From Here? A lot of reading. He didn't graduate from high school, but he did an enormous amount of reading in prison. He had an awakening, was radicalized and decided that he would return back to his community and transform the organization into, or the street organization or the gang into a political group. And in particular into the Puerto Rican counterpart of the Black Panther Party. Now, if you can imagine what this is, like, um, what the process might have been like to actually convince your brothers in a gang that they should turn their attention to their communities um, and do something completely different than they previously had, you can imagine that that was a Herculean task. Um, but uh, these are the young lords, as you can see, this, these are the young lords in Chicago. And by the way, they were Puerto Rican and Mexican Americans in Chicago. So one of the turning points that allowed uh, Chacha Jimenez to succeed was the killing of one of their own by a police officer in their neighborhood, Manuel Ramos. Chacha had been trying to convince everybody and their mother to, uh, to join him specifically in the struggle to stop the displacement of Puerto Ricans from their homes um, as a result of urban renewal, which was essentially that period's gentrification project. So when their own uh, was murdered by a police officer, the first thing they did was call Chacha Jimenez. Uh, Chacha was not present when this happened. They were all at a party and they called Chacha uh, in hopes of getting justice for, um, for Manuel Ramos. And this is among the, one of the meetings they had uh, in Chicago around this issue, but also many others. This is um, a, a photograph of an occupation of a police precinct by the Young Lords. After they became active, Chacha Jimenez was persecuted by the police and he was being stopped or arrested at least twice or three times a week. So they decided to literally go to the police department and, um, and challenge the police for their persecution of Chacha. Um, the FBI who surveilled them uh, doggedly said that there were 500 people at this occupation. And one of the fascinating things about the Young Lords who eventually uh, spread to New York City 
is that they occupied and identified the nerves, the nerve center of power and authority in uh, poor neighborhoods. The police station, they occupied a church, right? This is also a very powerful institution ideologically. Um, and they occupied a hospital, Lincoln Hospital. So uh, that's the story of their emergence. They're connected to the Black Panthers because they decided to, uh, to model themselves and their organization uh, on the model established by the Black Panther Party. And the Young Lords were a pivotal linchpin in the emergence of the Rainbow Coalition. The Rainbow Coalition was uh, launched by Fred Hampton, whom you might have heard about because of the film. Um, what's the name of the film again? Uh, that was hot not too long ago. It's a film about his life. Um, Fred Hampton was a powerful young leader in Chicago uh, and he launched the Rainbow Coalition, a coalition of oppressed people on the basis of class interest and across racial lines. So he brought together Black Americans in the Black Panther Party, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans in the Young Lords and poor whites from Appalachia who had settled in Chicago known as um, the Young Patriots. These are white folks. So this is a very powerful coalition that brought everyone together and started asking questions about um, exploitation and um, the exploitation of working class people of all races and how can we get together and challenge our condition. Uh, so uh, Fred Hampton and other members of the Black Panther Party said that the Young Lords were pivotal to the coalition because you can't really have a coalition of two, right? Of the Young Patriots with whom they were working and with the Black Panthers. Uh, so when the Young Lords emerged as an organization committed to fighting for justice in the Latino community, Fred Hampton saw this as an opportunity to fight for something much larger uh, than, um, than himself and the Black Panthers, uh, the Rainbow Coalition. So the Young Lords were, and all the young people of their generation were influenced by the civil rights movement and its radicalization um, during the black power era, which emerges between 1964 and 1965. And um, one thing that's really important to understand about, about this group of young people that included the young lords and the black panthers, but was a lot broader, that fought against the Vietnam War is that they transformed the culture of American society. How? These movements and the reason why we uh, talk about them and write about them transform the relationship between people of color and white Americans. They raised the problem of gender oppression and made this term gender um, a term used in American society, and they were also among the first uh, people of their generation to challenge US foreign policy and our, uh, the country's war in Vietnam. This is huge. So this was not a revolution um, that led to an overthrow of the American government, but it was a revolution that changed the consciousness and culture of American society. The Young Lords were mostly Puerto Rican youth um, who organized in the cities. They were working class uh, and they wanted to expose the country's um, quiet colonial project in Puerto Rico. They wanted to understand who they were. Who am I? Why am I? seen as an outsider in my society? That's a very quintessential question that young people ask themselves, who am I? Um, and what's my relationship to, to my peers and my society? And they discovered that the reason why their parents were here 
was because of US political and economic policies on the island, which essentially pushed out a third of the people of the island to cities like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia after World War II. Imagine, this is a massive epic displacement of people. A third of the people of the island of Puerto Rico were displaced after 1947 as a result of the United States industrialization project of the island, which failed to absorb many of the peasants and the people it displaced. So migration to the United States was the escape valve. And Puerto Ricans came to take the hardest, least paid jobs in New York, Chicago, and beyond. Um, and they were pushed around and, and thought of as inferior. Um, so the young lords are important because they help their generation understand their place in America and understand this process of colonization and how it influenced their daily lives, both here in the United States and, um, and in Puerto Rico. Um, these are, I'm showing you, um, I'm so, showing you images from their newspaper, Palante, which uh, they published bi-weekly in Spanish and English. Uh, and this, this says Hibaro Si Yankee No. Um, it's essentially uh, a call against US colonialism. So Yankee No and, um, and people who are close to the soil should be the victors or farmers. Um, all right, let's see if I can, okay. So these young people were the children of migration. That's essentially who the young lords are. And this is one of my favorite photographs because part of what they tried to do, and many of you are probably um, aware that first generation and second generation children of migrants help their parents adapt to the new society because we speak both English and Spanish. And here you have one of the leaders of the organization in New York Juan Gonzalez, who's also a very important writer who wrote a book called The Harvest of Empire, but he also wrote for the Daily News and he's um, a co-anchor with Amy Goodman of Democracy Now. He's on the six train selling a newspaper to, um, to one of you know his own, uh, someone of an older generation whom he's trying to uh, recruit or uh, to the to the organization, or he's trying to raise the consciousness of of people in the community. Um, and part of what they organized around was the um, disrepair of the American city, the fact that um, the city had been abandoned for all kinds of different reasons. During this period, we see uh, mass white flight from the city to the suburbs, that leads to economic decline, tax-based erosion. There's also the rise of deindustrialization during this period uh, after World War II. We tend to think of deindustrialization, the movement of factories out of the city and into the suburbs as something or away from your neighborhood as something that affects white Americans today. But in fact, before it affected uh, white Americans, it ravaged communities of color, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, uh, Black Americans uh, who migrated to the city during this period because deindustrialization begins, uh, begins after World War II. Um, they were organizing against displacement as a result of urban renewal. These were the issues that they turned their attention to. Um, here's an article they wrote in uh, the newspaper, urban renewal means big removal. One of the things that few people know about is that the neighborhood that currently houses Lincoln Center uh, in on Broadway and the 60s was previously uh, a neighborhood that housed 22,000 Puerto Rican families. And it was raised 
to build the most um, elite art center in the country, if not the world. Um, and ironically, the, uh, the film West Side Story, when it was filmed for the first time, used the rubble of that neighborhood for the film. Um, so, so this was the world in which the young lords lived and this was the world that they wanted to transform. Finally, they were self-proclaimed revolutionary nationalists who believed in the liberation of Puerto Rico and they were self-proclaimed socialists who had a critique of capitalism and wanted to build a socialist society organized around human need rather than uh, profit. Um, these are some of the images of the young lords in East Harlem. Um, and I love this photograph because they had such a tremendous sense of, of um, aesthetic. They looked hip and happening, but a lot of them were nerds too. And I appreciate that about the young lords. Um, this gentleman here, Mickey Melendez, is um, responsible for, for um, initiating the organization and bringing people together here in New York. Um, so I'll stop there. There's a lot more that can be said. Their first campaign was a garbage offensive, um, which they decided to focus on because they were community activists who polled the community and asked them, what do you think we should focus on? Police brutality, revolution? Uh, the liberation of Puerto Rico and the neighborhood people said, forget about all of that, the garbage. Um, and they proceeded to sweep the streets for weeks and weeks on end. When the garbage was not picked up, they deposited in the middle of the street, blocked traffic for days. Um, and they did this consecutively over many days and weeks. It caught the attention of, uh, of the media. This is the chairman of the organization in New York, Felipe Luciano. And um, it was one of the most colorful uh, campaigns of the organization that actually led to the transformation of garbage pickup in New York. It became an issue in the election of that season, literally. And the young lords were just uh, known for for putting this issue front and center um, and ensuring that their people, both Black Americans and Puerto Ricans, were not treated like garbage. Definitely, we need them back in New York. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, so much of that it's going into my mind. Uh, um, but um, I'm going to try to uh, stick to my original plan. And so, um, my next question has to do with a question that we always ask, I guess, authors at some point. They always get that question, which is really about the origins of the book, right? So what led you to, how did you even come across the Young Lords and what compelled you to tell the story really? Um, thank you for that question. Um... I learned about the Young Lords in college and it was my senior year, I think. I grew up in the Bronx and the Young Lords had occupied Lincoln Hospital where in fact, my father almost died in 1970 and the same year they occupied. And I was just shocked that this just powerful and inspirational history had been untold. Um, and two generations later, it was gone, right? Um, so I decided to go to graduate school. I applied to both law school and graduate school, got in to both. And then I had to figure out, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Um, I decided to go to graduate school and eventually after um, I did my coursework, the question of what are you gonna write about for your dissertation emerges and I decided to write about the Young Lords. And I learned in the process that, that sometimes we have to write our own history. 
You mentioned already so many of the uh, incredible actions that the young lords took um, to correct some of the problems that they saw in their communities and uh, in society, in the world. Um, is there any particular accomplishment that you believe was especially important? And then I would love to hear a little bit more about the occupation of the Lincoln Hospital. You have an entire chapter in the book on that. And obviously for us at Hostos, that's really something we can connect because the hospital is so close um, you know, to us. But most people might not know how controversial their relationship was with the community back in that 60s and 70s period. Right. So um, the question, what, what, what is most special about the Young Lords? It's a hard one to, to crack because I think they were successful, not because they did one thing, but because they committed themselves to uh, organizing at the level of the community consistently over time. They weren't around for too long, but what's significant is in history is not how long you're around for, but the extent to which you produce change, because history is a study of change over time. Um, so they, they were very disciplined. They were committed to political education. They read, they had to read um, daily political theory they read Marx, they read about the Cuban revolution. Um, they read history, the history of Puerto Rican independence movement. Um, they read about the Vietnam War uh, and the origins of the Vietnam War, everything under the sun. They believe that if we're revolutionaries, we need to understand society in order to, in order to transform it. Um, but if I had to name something, I would say probably, the Patient Bill of Rights. So they are known for drafting the first known Patient Bill of Rights. Think about this. These are very young people between the ages of 13 and maybe 25, 26 or 27. The majority of them are like age 17. And alongside of workers at Lincoln Hospital and doctors um, and people in the community, in the aftermath of, of the death of a Puerto Rican woman as a result of a botched abortion um, in 1970, the same year that abortion was legalized in New York state. And this is an interesting conversation to be having now because um, the right to, to, to choose what we do with our bodies as women is about to be overturned um, in the Supreme Court because of a leaked uh, document um, a few days ago. So a Puerto Rican woman dies because of a botched abortion. Essentially a resident was put in charge of performing the abortion and he failed to look at her record. Um, she had a heart problem and if you have a heart problem, uh, a saline abortion was a contraindication, but the resident didn't look at her record and she died during the procedure unnecessarily. Um, and so after this happened, the young lords got together, um, someone leaked the record of what happened to them so someone leaked to the young lords a record of what happened to this woman and they organized the campaign around it that summer of 1970 after they occupied the hospital. This, is, this happened like the day or two after they occupied the hospital. Um, and they forced the hospital to have a public meeting explaining to the community exactly what happened medically, something that has never happened apparently in the history of medicine, that, that doctors are forced to explain to a community 
a medical procedure uh, that went south. Um, and they also um, tried to uh, console her family, get her involved in the struggle. Um, they were looking for um, uh, what it, what it, the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, compensation, essentially, some kind of compensation. Not that the death of a, of a person can ever be uh, resolved or made whole. Um, and they proceeded to, to draft the first patient bill of rights that established some rules about this, the importance of talking to the patient about their health. Um, the medical profession was, was unreconstructed. It was backward. It was, it was very conservative um, and racist, but it was not only racist. Uh, doctors were seen as gods who were disconnected to their patients, regardless of, of race. And part of what they established was a series of rules. The patient has a right to know, and the doctor has a right to discuss the patient's conditions with, with the patient. Uh, they also said that healthcare is a human right and profit shouldn't be in, involved in the transaction. Um, and a number of other uh, points that I'll show you um, later on. Um, but what's the, so that's the, that's the, that's probably, I think, one of the most impressive, impressive um, gains of the organization, because this is something that we all take for granted today. You go to a hospital the world over and you, you actually see a patient bill of rights. That's, uh, that's really important. And I did not know that. So, um, that's something that should be mentioned in uh, history textbooks, I guess, which takes me to the next question I wanted to ask you, which you in some ways alluded to um, in your um, you know, earlier remarks about um, you know, the gap, right? That filling the voids when we are telling those, uh, those stories. So in your case, I mean, the, the void is that the fact that the history of the young lords has not been told, had not been told, not even within American radical history. So my question to you is, why do you think their story has been overlooked, was overlooked by other scholars in the left? Um, and how, at what point did you really realize that that story had to be told? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about, I guess, your discovery uh, in the historiography or better off with the lack of. I think that the writing of the history of the 60s is very political. Um, so historians started to write about the 60s in the 1980s during a very, very conservative period, during the rise of um, conservative reaction in the United States, the rise of Reaganism. So that influenced the, the period um, within which historians started writing, influenced their writing of history. So for, for those historians, they wanted to emphasize the good, the quote unquote, good 60s the civil rights movement, the history of Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference that he founded. Um, this was a story of uh, victory against uh, white supremacy and segregation. And it was a movement forward for American democracy. So for a very, very long time, Historians interested in this period wrote essentially about the civil rights movement. Um, it's not until later that they start writing about a trickier history that, that begins 
probably in 1963, when in fact Martin Luther King begins to raise the question of class in the South and the importance of what he called the package deal, that we can't fight racism uh, in word alone, that uh, racism has produced poverty among uh, racially oppressed people and black people in particular, and we need housing and we need education and we need decently placed job, decently um, uh, paid jobs. Uh, so that's what he called the package deal. And over the course of his life, Martin Luther King was himself radicalized. And by the end, people called him a revolutionary. Uh, he also challenged the United States involvement in Vietnam. Um, so eventually, uh, historians started branching out and talking about this more radical period when Americans, Black Americans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, people of color, Native Americans began to question the organization of American society, began to question capitalism, um, US foreign policy abroad, th and those were perceived as the bad years, right? The bad 60s. Um, and so eventually the history of the Black Panther Party started to be written, but also the history of the new left broadly defined. Many of the organizations that fought against the Vietnam War, um, like the Students for a Democratic Society. Um, and because this country lives in a racial straitjacket organized around this polarity, black and white, right? There's nothing in between. So many of these other movements that in fact the civil rights movement inspired by Puerto Ricans and by Mexicans and Chicanos, by Native Americans, many of these histories haven't really been um, written about uh, sufficiently. They're beginning to be uh, explored and have been probably over the last decade, uh, I would say. Um, so that's a long reason why, why there's a gap. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about the Lincoln occupation that you asked me about. Uh, I talked about what happened as a, uh, what led to the, to the, um, to the drafting of the Patient Bill of Rights. I want to tell you that they also organized a, uh, they occupied a church in East Harlem. And these are the cops who were sent to remove them 11 11 days later. Um, this is one of the posters of the organization and here we start. So Jewish migrants who settled in the Bronx used to call Lincoln Hospital the butcher shop of the Bronx. And so um, the young lords, Denise Oliver in particular, one of the members of the organization uh, uh, is, is the artist and she publishes this artwork in the newspaper. But how does it start? Um, all right. It starts with a complaint table. The young lords grew and they spread from East Harlem to the Bronx. And they were organizing in the South Bronx and they knew that Lincoln Hospital was struggle. So they helped organize a patient worker complaint table. They gathered more than a thousand complaints, delivered them to the administration, and the administration snuffed at, um, at their work. And they did this not alone, but in collaboration with workers uh, and doctors who, who, who were there at the complaint table. They took turns. And when that didn't work, the young lords published an article that was foreboding in their newspaper and said that this week, um, justice is going to be done at Lincoln Hospital. And on July 14th, 1970, with the blessing of a radical cohort of doctors, they occupied a, a wing of the hospital. And th this is an, uh, a photograph from the New York Times. 
they found these bags of salt, sterling rock salt in the hospital and used them to, to block stairways and doors and windows to keep the cops out. Um, and they had demands that they um, presented to the city, no cutbacks in jobs, because this was a moment of budget cuts. Uh, so no cuts in jobs or services to the emergency room, Immedi immediate funds to complete the building um, that was promised, uh, the new building that was promised a decade earlier. They demanded door-to-door -door preventative care, something that American medicine is not organized around. They believed alongside of uh, the doctors that um, disease could be prevented uh, with a better medical system that would go door to door. And they were inspired by the Cuban revolution and the Cuban revolution's advances in this area of health. Um, they asked for a permanent 24 hour complaint table and also for higher wages for um, the lowest paid workers in the hospital um, and all kinds of other things. This is also part of the occupation. This is clearly a doctor who is on their side. Um, and one thing to know about Lincoln Hospital and its surrounding area is that it had profound need. Um, it had a, um, a death rate, a mortality rate 50% higher than the rest of the country. And it had the highest heroin addiction in the world and it was ground zero for deindustrialization. So industries were leaving uh, the Bronx and uh, in, in droves um, and they left behind um, a city in disrepair, a borough in disrepair. This is their patient bill of rights. Um, so that's essentially the contours of the occupation and um, they, uh, the, the mayor got involved and sent his men to, to, um, to meet with them and to negotiate the release of the hospital. So they occupied for 24 hours. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, that particular story. Um, so I have a, a final question before we can turn it to the audience. And that question has to do with um, uh, your research. I mean, among the, the, the many wonderful things about your book is that your research is just so incredibly detailed. I mean, you have used the oral interviews of the Young Lords newspaper that you showed us some pictures, Palante, the personal papers of the Young Lords, along with all these sources related to the police and the FBI files, including something I didn't know even existed, the lost and the shoe files, um, which I learned uh, consist of over 1 million uh, files of New Yorkers so that were kept by the New York City Police Department between 1954 and 1972. So can you tell us a little bit more about your research process and uh, is there something about your sources that really surprised you that you didn't know that kind of shocked you, you know, when you found out? Um so there's so many things and I literally turned myself into Inspector Gadget because there was very little, there was very little information um, about the Young Lords. No one had really written about them. I wrote the first dissertation about the organization. The newspapers were available, uh, but seemingly nothing else. But if you look, you'll find. And I found a treasure trove of all kinds of things. I went into the municipal archive of the city of New York. And I knew that the Young Lords had done a lot of work around lead poisoning. And I literally go, went to their vertical files. All libraries have vertical files, which are essentially articles that librarians like cut out while they're working and they put in a file so that people decades later can go in and figure out what was going on in the period. And one of the librarians thankfully had put in there um, an article in the Journal of Public Health 
that identified the young lord's muckraking and occupation or sit-in at the Department of Health and door-to-door -door testing for lead poisoning and all the pressure they put on the city, uh, they, they credited the young lord's activism with the passage of lead poisoning legislation in New York. Um, so I was like, ka-ching, amazing. Um, so there's a lot. Then I sued the cops and that's a story that is long and involved. And the story of the Hanshu files is even more epic. Essentially they emerged because during the, um, the trial of the Panther 21, the longest trial in New York city history, the lawyers defending the Black Panthers realized that there was an enormous amount of surveillance of the police, uh, of the Black Panthers and other organizations by the police because they subpoenaed the documents of the police. And after the end of that, of that trial uh, about the Black Panthers and their persecution by the police, the lawyers who defended them decided to sue the cops for violating the Black Panther Party's First Amendment rights, in particular, the right of association. So the right of speech had been litigated in the 1920s. Interestingly enough, we think that the rights we have have been you know, respected since time immemorial. But in fact, it wasn't until the 1920s that uh, after World War I, that the First Amendment became this hallowed um, right among Americans. But it was litigated only around the right to speech. In the 1960s with the Black Panthers and their persecution, now lawyers litigated the right of association. And at the end of that trial, the, the judge, Judge um, Haight, said, Charles Hay said that New Yorkers have a right to know what the police have been doing, uh, uh, per, uh, essentially surveilling everyone under the sun, not just activists, but like the church lady uh, in the corner. So they demanded, the, not, the, not the they, the judge demanded that the police deposit the files with the municipal archive of the city of New York, and they never did. Uh, and so I was the first person to sue since that 1985 decision for those papers. And by the way, I don't know what happened at Hostos, but when I, when I sued, it was all over the news and the New York Times. I got a lot of emails from administrators and professors at Hostos who had tried to get these files and were not able to. There were struggles at Ostos that were persecuted, um, that were, yeah, that were persecuted by the cops and, um, and people who lost their jobs. And, uh, and they knew, they knew that something was going on and they tried to investigate, but got nowhere. Anyway, um, one last thing I'll say. After I wrote my dissertation, I was invited to do um, to organize these art exhibits in Chicago and at the University of North Carolina. And I hadn't really looked at the photographs of the Young Lords. And what I discovered when I was examining the photographs of the Young Lords for these exhibitions is that the majority of the Young Lords are of a darker hue. They're darker, they're like Afro-Latinos. And that transformed my understanding of the organization. Um, of the five members of the official leadership body of the organization, the Central Committee, um, three of them were Black Latinos or Black Puerto Ricans. Um, also, a third of the members of the organization in New York were Black Americans, not Latino. Um, so, so I learned that the organization was profoundly um, diverse ethnically and that it was led by 
by black Puerto Ricans and black Cubans. There were a few black Cubans uh, in the organization. Um, and, and later I, I wrote about how they theorized um, racism in Latin America, uh, the young lords. Like this is something that's sexy that everyone's writing about now. Um, what racism looks like in Latin America. And they theorized race ideology as it emerged in Latin America when they were kids um, in the organization. And they wrote about it. Yeah, they wrote about it. That woman, Denise Oliver, is the, is the um, first woman to be elected to the leadership body and she's black American. Um, uh, so they wrote about it. They wrote about it in the, in the, in the newspaper, I'll show you. Um, oh, oh, I didn't, I didn't put it in here somehow. Uh, oh yeah, no, yes, here it is. I don't know how I skipped it. Um, so this article, um, theorizes, and they talked about this in their meetings, uh, the difference between racism as it emerged in, um, in Puerto Rico and Latin America and and the United States. The difference between the emergence of race ideology in Latin America, as opposed to the United States. So that's it. That's, I mean, that's one of, one of the, I think the most incredible findings, the, the, the racial composition of the organization that emerges as a result of, a, of looking at a different archive, right? Oftentimes we don't look at, Historians don't look at photographs. We might look at two or three, um, but, but not at a cache of photos, which I had to find in order to, to, um, to curate this art exhibit. Anyway, um, and I, it, it took so long to write this book that I feel like I found everything under the sun. Of course, there's always much more to find. But I'll stop now because I'm sure that there are questions and we should open it up to the. Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Uh, um, uh, and uh, if you can see them directly on the QA, Dr. Fernandez, it might make more sense for you um, oh, okay. to get them. Otherwise, I'll read them to you. So let yeah, me I'm... know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm terrible with these things, but let's see. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I have no problem like sharing them and reading them over. So um, we have uh, uh, right now two questions. Uh, the first one from Professor Ozuna. Um, she is actually one of our professor at Hostos in the Black Studies uh, um, uh, unit. Uh, and uh, she actually had an event right before this one on what is Black Studies. So anyway, their um, question has to do, um, I'll read it. Uh, what a fascinating and comprehensive history of community activism and knowledge production. What is, Dr. Fernandez, your vision of the future of community activism, particularly direct action, considering emerging technologies? So I guess it's a, a question trying to connect the past activism with um, possibilities for today. Oh my goodness, how do I answer this question? <laughs> a question. Um, what seems missing from contemporary protest is that kind of longstanding commitment to on the ground community organizing that's sustained and that focuses on a campaign, develops a strategy and either loses or wins. And we haven't seen that in a while. There might have been some, um, some campaigns in Chicago around uh, the district attorneys, but those, those campaigns, if I'm not mistaken, led to an electoral process, right? Um, which then changes, changes the, um, the action, I mean, it's no longer activism. It's no longer pressuring politicians. It's kind of joining the system and negotiating the terms of people's oppression. 
um, in, in public office. Um, I definitely think that social media is a boon. Uh, it's incredible what can happen with social media and the ways in which people can begin to collaborate across the world and across the country. But there is a sense among young people that, that that's where activism begins and ends organizing. Although that's be beginning to be challenged. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a, a crystal ball. So I don't, I don't know what the future holds and historians don't predict the future, but, but I think we, you know, I think what we, what history teaches us is that wherever there's oppression, there's struggle eventually. Thank you. And of course, you know, if other panelists want to chime in uh, uh, with both the questions and um, oh, uh, yeah. comments to this, uh, feel free. But we do have uh, two more questions in the meantime. So this and is let me from present Professor Osuna for that question. This is uh, from uh, the next two questions are actually from members of my uh, department. Um, uh, Professor Valdez Portela is asking, I don't know if this is, this will be part of our conversation. I guess he brought this while we were still uh, talking. Why the radicality of social movements today has changed? Why is it difficult for similar radical movements to those like the Young Lords to arise today when we see that relatively similar problems persist in our society. Right. Um, hmm. Woo. Um, so I think that part of what has happened in the United States over the course of its history is that the radical tradition has been buried either as a result of government persecution, um, mostly government persecution uh, and these cyclical red scares that emerge throughout American history. Um, and if you don't think that there was a red scare in this period post Cold War, there was a, a, red, a kind of red scare in the war on terror, right? When you were either with us or against us and you were forbidden to critique American society. Um, so that develops a complacent society, right? That's scared of, of taking risks uh, and challenging the government. Um, so I would say that that the reason why the radicality of social movements today has changed is because the left tradition has been literally uprooted from American society. Uh, the persecution of 60s radicals is, was unforgiving. Uh, someone like Fred Hampton was assassinated Latin American style in his sleep in Chicago for everyone to see. Um, and dozens of Black Panthers were killed, but the police and the, the FBI surveilled uh, all the activists, the anti-war activists, students for a democratic society. Um, so I think govern the government has a lot to do with this and certainly changing technology. But I, I would say that, that um, that the tradition is not alive. Like you go to other countries and there is a robust critique of society and there are different voices, but increasingly in American society, there's really just one voice, the Democrats and the Republics, Republicans who increasingly sound alike. I mean, it seems like our, our public discourse has moved tremendously to the right and then there's a void, right? Someone like Bernie Sanders, um, is kind of illegally uh, axed out of, of the public debate. One of the reasons, by the way, one of the reasons why, why um, 
why the Young Lords succeeded, by the way, was because they modeled themselves after the Black Panther Party. So they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Think about how long it takes to develop an organizational structure. It takes years. If you've ever worked in a, with a group, it takes months to figure out who we are, what we stand for, and how we're gonna organize ourselves. Um, and the Young Lords followed you know, a model that was successful and ran with it. Um, and that has a lot to do with their success. You know, another problem with um, McCarthyism and red scares in the United States is that in the United States, organization is kind of frowned upon. People want to stand as individuals in society, right? But no one as an individual has done anything to transform society. Behind Martin Luther King, there was a Christian leadership conference and a massive movement that he was a part. Same with Malcolm X, um, um, Ella Baker. Uh, um, these are people who, who committed to organization and developed uh, politically in the context of organization and accomplished what they did collectively alongside of other people. Oh, Oops. Marcia. Yeah. I, I was too quick, I mute, unmuted and then quickly muted myself again. Um, uh, I, I do have some thoughts about this, but I'll leave them Please, for the very no. end because no, we do have other questions. I wanna really make sure that we get through them because they are wonderful. Uh, the next question is from Professor Hoyland, uh, a sociologist in my department. She asks, can you talk about the role of women uh, Iris Morales or Iris Morales uh, came to host us uh, several years ago to discuss their books and experiences. How does your research extend or expand the role of women in the Young Lords? And um, yeah, I'll get to the next question um, afterwards. Well, Iris Morales has written the book on women uh, in the Young Lords. I have a chapter on the race and gender politics of the organization. The Young Lords were phenomenal in that the women of the organization uh, started meeting together after the church occupation. So after the first church occupation, I didn't talk about it, but they occupied a church in December, 1969, that gave the organization an enormous amount of publicity and there was an increase in membership. And therefore, with an in increase in membership, uh, more women joined the organization. There were very few women. Women were present at the beginning, but men outnumbered women. Uh, their numbers grew and they started meeting together under the leadership of people like Iris Morales and Denise Oliver uh, and others and talking about what was wrong and, and how you know, there was a discrepancy between the high aspirations of the organization around issues of gender equality and what folks experienced, women in particular, on the ground. Um, and they started challenging the men of the organization. It didn't go well for some time. Um, women, for example, wanted to be treated equally across the board. They wanted to be able to join, for example, the defense committee, um, or the defense ministry uh, and be taught martial arts. And some of the men said, okay, well, why don't you join us? And they uh, abused the women physically in the process. Mm. Um, so there was definitely a backlash, but uh, through the, the efforts of women, they were able to educate at least some of the men um, and what I noticed when I was writing the chapter, which hasn't really um, been written about, is that for a period of time between uh, December 1969 and June 1970, the women of the Young Lords were just writing about issues of gender day in and day out in every newspaper. Um, and so that raised the issue and raised um, the level of consciousness among women 
and also men in the organization. And finally, there was a big struggle that uh, led to Denise Oliver being, being um, uh, elected to the formal leadership body of the organization. Um, one of the fascinating things about the organization is that they had both a women's caucus for a period and a men's caucus in which women and men talked separately about the issue of gender um, and how they had been socialized in the ways they were either as women in, in the realm of passivity or, or um, men in the realm of aggression. Um, and so they tried to deconstruct um, that socialization in these, in these uh, caucuses, which in many ways mirrored uh, the women's movement's consciousness raising circles. And I can go on and on, but, uh, but people should read Iris, Iris Morales' book, hold on, um, I get fighting, it's got rebel women in the title, hold on. I have it here somewhere. Oh, yeah. Through the Eyes of Rebel Women, The Young Lords, 1969 to 1979. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the next the question is from a person that is very uh, well known to both you and me, Johanna. Uh, Victor Wallis, uh -huh. a long-term long -term editor of the wonderful um, uh, journal, Socialism and Democracy. Uh, welcome, Victor, um, and thank you for, for coming to the, uh, to the event. So his question is, can one argue that the radical type of organizing is being revived in the struggles of workers at Amazon, Starbucks, Apple, et cetera. Oh, absolutely, definitely. I mean, I fail to, to mention these struggles which are not uh, insignificant. It seems that during the pandemic, there was an uptick in worker struggles across the country fighting for their lives, essentially, um, in the context of the pandemic and uh, insufficient precautions um, and uh, terrible working conditions. Uh, and just recently, in fact, I, I heard an interview uh, with Chris Smalls. Uh, he's the man who began to organize uh, workers it, locally here, I think in Long Island at Amazon. He was interviewed by, um, by Trevor Noah. Oh my God, of course, I interviewed him first when I was a host of The New Day on WBAI. Um, but it was amazing to see this man in this very mainstream uh, uh, venue talking about the significance of bringing power back to workers and the working class. Um, it, it was tremendously um inspiring and uh and i think we definitely need to help um build that tradition within within the workplace I yeah and there are there are signs also interestingly that younger uh workers are taking on the lead to create uh, a more um powerful role for uh, new unions and existing unions. So, so um, you know, a lot has changed, but I also think that there is always, always the potential for transformation, that uh, there is always a right time to start a revolution. <laughs> um, there's, right. There are also agricultural workers, predominantly Latino, who are organizing in the Northeast um, and in the South uh, mm -hmm. right now as we speak. Um, so, so there seems to be um, a change uh, underfoot. We have two more questions, so I'm certainly hoping we can get to them uh, before the end of our event. Um, one is from one of my students. So, um, Ana Maria, if you allow me, I'd like to start with the, the student since it's the first uh, 
actually questions we are getting from students. So this is uh, Patricia Thomas uh, um, wondering what ended the Young Lords Coalition? Is there any other coalition that is modeled um, after their beliefs? Um, so, I mean, this is a question that I answer um, uh, pretty thoroughly in, in the last chapter of my book. I think we have to put the onus on uh, the persecution of the young lords and other radicals and activists by COINTELPRO, which essentially sought to create um, conflict uh, in the organization. COINTELPRO literally sent um, infiltrators uh, and the end was quite violent, always um, stimulated by uh, by outside meddling, in particular uh, COINTELPRO. But there are other reasons why um, the coalitions uh, ended or the organization devolved. The mass character of the movement had waned by 1976. There was um, a rise of uh, conservative politics underfoot in American society. And the Young Lords, unlike other organizations, emerged in the heat of struggle, right? So what we usually see is that organizations that emerge in the heat of struggle during um, social movements tend to uh, disappear or wane once the movements subside. But what we have is this incredible history um, that's awe-inspiring, um, and we have lessons for how to, to build coalitions uh, among workers and people in the community um, and, and others who, like the Young Lords, um, commit themselves to building a revolutionary society. Um, and the question is also, is always, how do we fight for reforms and fight to win um, small victories like the Patient Bill of Rights um, or the passage of lead poisoning legislation and also continue to fight for a completely new society organized around human need rather than profit? That tension of fighting for reform and revolution is always one that that radicals are grappling with. And I'm wondering if this Patricia Polanco is my friend from New York City with whom I grew up. I think she might be. There are not that many Patricia Thomases. Okay, let's hear from Ana Maria Flores. All right, so this is uh, Professor Flores from the Humanities Department. Uh, dear Fernandez, earlier you spoke about the expectation in academia that historians and other scholars must be objective in our work. What do you think about approaching our scholarship as a counter-academic project as named by the Brujillas of Bruja Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Uh -huh. meaning our knowledge production comes from both the head and the heart? and we no longer remove ourselves objectively from our work. And this, I believe, will be our last question. Oh my God, that, um, that's a very beautiful question and it, it brings emotion to my heart because absolutely the radical tradition doesn't leave the heart in the lockbox. It brings the heart and a vision of a new society into the writing of history. Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's not, and, and it is within the academic tradition. So I wanna, I wanna say that, that there are different trends within the academic tradition and we can't dispose um, of the radical one. Uh, we need to rebuild it within the academy. But I'm also for creating a counter academic project. However, um, I think there's a place for intellectual debate and discussion that's rigorous. 
uh, in society everywhere, not just in the academy. Um, and I fear that some counter academic projects could turn anti intellectual, although I'm sure that Ana Maria Flores is not uh, in that brigade. Uh, I just want to say that one of my reviewers wrote um, that Professor Fernandez's work is imbued with feeling. And I was just honored. Most professors would run screaming into the night if their work were described, but I'm confident enough in the, in the scholarship I produced. Um, and, uh, and when I read that, I, that's exactly it. I, you know, we read books that change our lives. Like knowledge is profoundly liberatory and and we need to be part of the tradition that seeks to change people, um, their aspirations and their outlook on society um, and their determination for fight for a different world. Uh, and you need to do that with feeling. And the history of the young lords is imbued with feeling. I mean, I cried reading documents um, of the organization. So the last thing I'm gonna say is this very moment in the history organization, they occupied the church and they were arrested. 107 of them were arrested um, and they had to go to court. And I interviewed the young lords when they were uh, and asked them about their experiences when they were children. And so many of them told me that they were ashamed um, that they never challenged the mispronunciation of their names as children. And in the courtroom, they all stood up and properly pronounced their names when the judge mangled them. There's a, a passage in the book that is just uh, very emotional. And it's on this issue of asserting your humanity in the face of degradation at the hands of you know, authorities in society, whether it's a, a, a a judge or a racist teacher in that period. I believe we are exactly at five o'clock and I can't believe that we made it on time. And just as I say that we had the time for uh, questions, which oftentimes, you know, uh, doesn't happen oftentimes because of no one's intentional, you know, but just like, you know, lack of time. So. I really, really, um, I'm really happy this worked out the way it did. I want to thank, of course, uh, Dr. Fernandez for taking the time to be here. I want to just uh, say this publicly for people to really appreciate the time that many people some time give. Um, that unfortunately. Um, you know, anything that's organized at CUNY with other CUNY faculty, even if it's outside of one's college, they cannot be compensated. So I just want to mention again, this, just for people to appreciate that oftentimes we see these amazing speakers taking their time and sharing their knowledge and their research and their books with us, uh, but they're doing so um, absolutely free, right, because they want to. Um, so I am especially um, grateful to uh, Dr. Fernandez, but I also want to extend my gratitude, as it was mentioned by uh, Dr. Yalongo earlier, to the President's Office, to the uh, uh, Sofia Oviedo, who has uh, um, really uh, granted me uh, some, some money to the McKenzie Initiative to uh, found uh, uh, 20 copies of this uh, amazing, incredible book that uh, we will give to 20 people who have attended the, uh, the, uh, the webinar. Um, and that was the purpose of having that survey and some kind of attendance so that we can figure out uh, who attended and who <laughs> is interested in getting the books. Um, and finally, uh, please, if you didn't get a chance to do so, um, uh, I posted the link to a uh, feedback for the survey. And I just wanna publicly thank uh, the two students 
who actually uh, created it. Um, there are two students in my honors class, Kateri Arroyo and Duana Reynoso. So thank you for that too. And um, again, if someone has a final thought or a final word, uh, please go ahead. I just wanted to uh, also thank you publicly. I, I really wanted you to be here because of the power of your, of your work. Uh, and also because um, both Clarence Taylor was my dissertation advisor and Josh Freeman was also on my dissertation committee. So we come out of that CUNY, that CUNY tradition uh, and it's always wonderful, especially to share the, the, the scholarship of CUNY scholars um, with, our, with our college community. So thank you again. Thank you. And I'd like to publicly thank uh, Victor Wallace only because I was looking for, for one of my chapters. Uh, today, I, I'm writing something uh, for another venue and I found one of Victor's edits of my chapters. He read pretty much the whole book um, and yeah, and was an incredible support um, throughout the process. So I want to thank him publicly for all the, all the work he did on my writing and, and my work. And also we want to uphold the, the journal that we are both um, involved in editing. Do you want to put it up? The, the journal Socialism and Democracy. And before we leave, uh, I think uh, my chair, uh, Dr. Yalongo, would like to just give us a final uh, salute, I guess. And then uh, Nelson, I guess you can take it from there. Um, I just want to thank you very quickly for your wonderful discussion. Um, I, like my colleagues here, am an historian, so I very much appreciate your discussion about resources, about fighting to get some stuff that at first doesn't seem available. I don't expect you to speak about this, but I was very satisfied to hear you utter, almost in passing, but it meant so much to me, sometimes we have to write our own history. And there isn't a word that I ever put on paper that isn't reflective of my history, my people's history, individually and broadly spoken, because we have an obligation to speak to it. So I really appreciated that so much. Thank you for being here. This is a wonderful event for the college, for the department, for everyone in attendance. Thank you. You said it eloquently. Thank you. Thank you again, everybody. Have a safe and good night.